What's up, everybody? Chris here, hanging out with our influencers again, and we are continuing our Bible study, and we are on Mark chapter 6. And as we continue in Mark, we continue to learn uh, about how Mark is just like go time on the message, uh, really teaching us that like Jesus is the Messiah, and then asking us, do you agree or disagree by the end of this? So I'm curious, chapter 6, what stood out to you guys? I didn't really understand the beginning of it, where he goes to goes to the synagogue in his hometown. It says it ends with like him saying, "A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own household." I was confused on what that meant. Like, does it mean he is accepted everywhere except by like his own kind, I guess, or like his own? Because Jesus is a Jew, so. He's ex- like every other person accepts him besides the people that he was surrounded with when he was a child or the Jews. I'm going to guess the Jews. I don't know, but he did say, Jesus said that like prophets have honor everywhere except in their own country, their own family, and their own home. So I don't know if it's like this circumstance is specific to him or if it's just like for every prophet, which still doesn't really make that much sense to me. Aren't his family Jewish? Everything he's doing isn't actually debunking the Jewish faith. It's fulfilling it. They just don't think it's exactly how they expected it to be. So there's like this tension of like the Messiah is coming and they're going to fix everything. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm the Messiah, but I, it's not going to work the same way you think it is. <laughs> and then it ends with, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. So unbelief in the rest of the stories or in a lot of stories in the Bible, a lot of them are about people who believe in him. And that is why they are healed is because they believe in him. Like the person reaching out and grabbing his cloak, like we were talking about in the story with Talitha. And he like turns around and feels the power like leaving him. He's like, who touched me? And it's, it's because she believed in him. And then all these other instances where the people did believe in him, and that's be, why they were healed. And then in this one, it tells us about how he's talking about how they do not believe in him. He's not accepted where he is. And it talks about how, is it not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? They took offense to him. And then he talks about how, you know, the prophet is not accepted in his hometown. So the unbelief part, in this instance, does that mean that he healed them, even though they didn't believe, in order to show them, like, is it him, like, proving, I am who they say I am? Like, that's why he's marveled at it, because he's like, I can do all these amazing things. You guys still don't, like, believe me? Why Why are you guys doing this, you know? I like all of that. I I actually think you guys are trying to read too much into it. I think Jesus is basically like going home. It's like, guys, the kingdom of God is here. I'm going to heal some people as a sign of the kingdom of God. And everyone's like, who's this guy think he is? And he's the guy that just like, just builds stuff. He's like, that guy's brother, right? Yeah, we know him. Or someone's like, I put diapers on him. He is not the savior. Like, mm-mm. Like... <laughs> Do you remember when, like, all that's happening? And so, like, all that background, I think, sort of is, like, implied there, where they're like, mm, nah. I guess I could see that being weird for them, because, like, I was thinking about that. Like, Jesus was a baby, and then he grew up into becoming, like, the Messiah. And so that must be super weird for them to be like, no, 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 no. we, like, know him. That That is really weird. Because he did, he wasn't born with that little like light circle thing that you see in paintings. Like that wasn't actually like there the whole time. <laughs> it's easy for us today to think about everyone having a cell phone with a camera on it and posting it to social media. And you can see what happened thousands of miles away. Stuff that happened 20 miles away for them was passed by word of mouth. And so someone may come into Nazareth and say, hey, hey I heard Jesus like killed a bunch of people. And they're like, He never did that here, you know, until now. It wasn't until he said, now the kingdom is here, that that started happening. And so you have that piece of it, too, that, you know, they couldn't go on social media or a news outlet and see a video uploaded of him healing people. You know, it just came to them by word of mouth. And they're like, nah, we know Jesus. 
you, you must be thinking of another Jesus or, you know, something like that. To get someone to believe something, you can show them all this evidence, but, and give them all the tools to make them believe something. It's really up to them whether or not if they choose to believe it. I think that's very wise. And that goes back to what Eli was talking about, about the faith part. Like a lot of what Mark is up to is pointing out like belief and faith in Jesus. And this section kind of points out maybe that wasn't really there in hometown. Hometown hero wasn't really a thing for Jesus. I still don't completely understand all the beef with John the Baptist. I thought he was a good guy. And then all of a sudden, this little girl is like, I want his head. Her mom said that. but Yeah, so King Herod, a little obsessed with John the Baptist, right? Why? Why do you think he's obsessed? Okay, so wait. Um, from this line right here, so, it, so apparently they couldn't kill John, uh, John because Herod knew he was a righteous and holy man. So I guess he was worried about what would happen if he killed him from that knowledge. Um, I just went back and looked. It's because I'm assuming it's because he was talking about how Jesus was coming and how like something big was coming. So John's announcing a coming king, a savior, a new kingdom. How do you feel if you're the king right now? <laughs> yeah, everybody's like, cool, the king's coming. And you're like, Whoa. hey, crown, guys. So what he does is he keeps his friends close and his enemies closer. It still says that he enjoyed listening to him, though, which I thought was interesting because he says that what he heard him say to him about stealing his brother's wife was disturbing, but then he also still enjoyed listening to him. So I'm confused. I don't know. That's a very weird dynamic, like having him as his enemy because he knows that like somebody's coming to take his throne, but then also having some respect or interest in him. Yeah, like, what, wouldn't you just think that if someone's telling you that, like, well, you're a king, another king is coming, wouldn't you want to kill them because you don't want that, like, news to spread? I guess it's already spread, but still, like, it's kind of common that if you're speaking out against something that the king doesn't like, he's going to behead you. Some of the very rich and more powerful Jews, when the Romans came in, kind of said, you know, they were given the opportunity to swear allegiance to Caesar. And if they did that, then they kind of got put up in these puppet leadership roles. So as king of this province, it was his job to keep the peace, to make sure taxes kept coming to Rome. I mean, to put it in today's terms, Herodias is a gold digger. I mean, if you think of it in those terms, you know, it's easy to read this and assume, well, we know how marriage is supposed to work and that people should love each other and they should sacrifice for each other and all of these things. But Herodias is looking out for herself and trying to set her and her daughter up in a place where they're going to have the most power and money uh, at the time. And John calls her out on it and she didn't like that. It's a messed up story, right? Yeah, but it makes a lot more sense. Also, because I kind of forgot how marriage back then is different than it is now. And it was more business transaction-y versus like actual love, I guess. But at the same time, I think that that's one of the beautiful things about the Bible is it doesn't, it doesn't cut out the mess that we're in and the things that are around us. It's like, hey, here's reality and here's what the kingdom looks like in the middle of garbage. You know, John was living out kingdom in the middle of garbage by saying, hey, this is not God's way. This is not not right. Even though it may be the world's way, Herodias was living the world's way. Herod was living the world's way. You know, you have someone saying this isn't God's way. Was the main point of the feeding the 5,000 just to have faith and then God will provide? I mean, personally, I think it's a lot. Just have faith. Do you think they did anything in that story? What do you mean by they? the disciples. While we're thinking about that, just for clarification for you guys, this was probably closer to 15 to 20,000. It was 5,000 men. That's how it was counted. Yeah, the women and children were not in that number. The disciples were the ones that went out to find the, the, the loaves and the fish. My translation, which this is the, um, there were 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish left over. And ours says the disciples picked up. 12 baskets they also directed everyone to sit down jesus said hey help them get in a group so they helped organize them it's important to know sometimes the bible is portrayed as something out there other than bigger than 
and this is why a lot of times you'll hear Chris, you know, come back to, you'll hear Travis come back to, and it's always important to come back to, how does this impact your every day, you know, going out there life? Why is it important to the story of Jesus? Well, you could have the story of Jesus without this story. And there may only be 13 people in this story that understood what happened. Okay. The thousands of people that are out there may have just seen someone bringing a basket full of food to them. They may have not known the source of, hey, there were only two fish and a few loaves of bread that fed 15,000 people. But why would that be important to the disciples? I guess is what it comes back to, Kerrigan, to, to turn your question back around is let's assume that only the 12 disciples knew what happened from beginning to end. What would that mean to them? Jesus took, and when we say loaves, they're more like, do y'all know what non is? Okay, that's the type of loaves that they would have had then. So it would have been about seven of those discs that you pull apart, two fish. And it's like they watched Jesus just pull a piece of non off and put it in the basket. And then the non was complete. And he would pull a piece off and put it in the basket. And it's like he didn't pull anything off. And he just kept. I mean, and we have to think of the time frames. How long would it take Jesus to break bread and fish to feed 15,000 people? And then he says, go pick up the remains. And the whole time that they're thinking, because you said they had faith, you know, in actuality, they were the ones saying, what do you mean feed these people? We would have to have enough money that like 10 times some people's annual salary to feed all of these people. There's no way to do that. And he said, well, go find out what food that you do have. And so then not only did he make enough to feed everyone there, then he told them, now go pick up all the leftovers, to which they're probably thinking, there's not going to be any leftovers. And then they bring 10, 12 basketfuls, which is enough for what? How many of them are there? So every single one of them went out and got a full basketful of food. Sometimes we try to play this into the story of Jesus. Like, well, how does that help me? Maybe it doesn't. But if you have someone that you're telling they're going to have to spend the rest of your life spreading your message and expanding the kingdom, and you know that you're going to die on a cross, and it's going to shatter their world for a few days, then you're going to reshatter their world when you come back to life, and then you're going to reshatter their world when you just fly off to heaven, and then you're going to reshatter their world when the Holy Spirit comes down, and it looks like fire, and it touches them, and then you talk, talk in all these different languages. There's these different memories he wants to leave with them to remember what he's capable of because they were all killed for their faith. And most people don't die for something unless they know it's worth dying for. You know, and I think that that even gives Jesus another flavor. I mean, yeah, we get to hear, okay, well, that's really cool. He fed, you know, 15,000 people, but it's not written to us. It was written to the people. And, you know, the disciples are the ones that are retelling these stories. And so, you know, they would be the ones saying, man, one time, you're not going to believe this, but one time, and so it was, it, it may have been more for them than us, but it's still a cool story. And that's still true today is like the church is supposed to share the God stories that we have with each other to encourage each other in our faith to keep going. So when I'm like, Hey, I experienced God by that can encourage all of you. And then when you do that, that encourages me. And we learn in this story that there's that encouragement of like, hey, you might feel limited by this world. I'm not. And I'm so not limited by this world, you're going to end up with more as leftovers than you started with as like what you have. So I will take what you have and multiply it into abundance beyond what you can even dream of.